So I've got a few questions to ask. Um, and actually, before I before we begin, I should just say um, uh, or ask uh, for the tape what your name is and could you tell me what your job is? All right. My name is uh, Sam Vaknin. I'm currently professor of psychology in several universities, several countries, and author of uh, uh, books in a variety of uh, fields. The one relevant to you would probably be Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, which is a book which deals with pathological narcissism and its manifestations from the individual level to, uh, to the collective uh, level. Great, thank you. Um, so, as you've, as you've pointed out, you've written extensively on narcissism and uh, you've got a YouTube channel that I've been watching and you've also appeared on Vice as well. So, ha from, from what you've seen uh, and what you've... Um, how, how is a narcissist created? How is a narcissist created? Yeah. Well, narcissism is thought to be um, a reaction to um, an abusive environment, traumatizing environment. Uh, and uh, the definition of abuse in this sense is wider than, than typically perceived. It's not limited to sexual, verbal, or physical abuse, or psychological abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, putting the child on a pedestal, pampering and spoiling the child, endowing the child with a sense of unlimited entitlement, incommensurate with his or her achievements, and so on and so forth. I also, are also considered forms of abuse because the child is instrumentalized, objectified, and mm. used as a tool to um, gratify the parent in a variety of ways. The child's boundaries are not recognized, they are breached. The child is not allowed to separate and individuate. Every, every penetration, so to speak, of the child's emerging periphery, emerging sense of separateness and, and individuation is considered abusive. Mm. And so abuse has many forms. Um, and children exposed to abuse, a, a tiny minority admittedly, opt for a solution of becoming abusers themselves um, in the obviously mistaken belief that should they become abusers, they will no longer be amenable to abuse and the pain it inflicts on them. Mm. And so what they do, they, they create, they concoct a kind of confabulation known as the false self. The false self is everything the child is not. The child is helpless. The false self is omnipotent. The child is unable to predict the next moves of the capricious adults around him. The false self is omniscient, knows everything, godlike. The, the child is, is castigated as a bed unworthy object in case he fails or fails to to realize the expectations of the parent and the false self is of course perfect and brilliant etc etc yeah. and the false self also serves a function of uh, as a decoy the false self is is a firewall it stands between the child and the and the painful or hurtful environment so it absorbs all the external shocks of abuse and in this sense, and only in this sense, narcissism can be construed as a form of a dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder. Well, the narcissist actually has two personalities. One is a hidden, childlike, uh, suffering, true self, and one is a protective, externalized, um, all-powerful, godlike co uh, creation, which is the false self. That, in a nutshell, is narcissism. My work, in my work currently, I'm trying to recast narcissism, um, not as a personality disorder, but as a post-traumatic condition. Right. A and post-traumatic condition with elements of addiction, elements of attachment disorder, and elements of depression, um, as a de depressive disorder. Um, that would be quite quite the revolution should this view be accepted because mm. hitherto over well over well over a century narcissism has been considered a character defect something to do with the personality in totality um, and I think actually the personality of the narcissist is quite okay mm. however 
it it has it suffers from a post traumatic syndrome. It's a form of CPTSD, complex post traumatic stress disorder. Again, that's in a nutshell. And so it has quite a a, a strong element is that it's about how the child or, or the, the person views themselves. Am I yes, right in I, understanding? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So it's how, how they view themselves. Well, narcissism is a, is a form of reinvention. It's an mm. early childhood reinvention. The child reinvents himself as God. Yeah. And in effect, narcissism is a form of private religion where there is mm. a, a godlike entity, which is the false self. And the child worships the false self. Mm. And also the child makes human sacrifice to the false self. In, in other in, people? No, in sacred. Well, later on, true. But initially, in sacrificing himself. Ah. The child, child tells the false self, listen, let's make a deal. I will annul myself. I will negate myself. I'll vitiate myself. And essentially, I will, I will sacrifice myself. I'll kill mm. myself. Um, on condition that you protect me, insulate me from, from fear and pain. And and be with me forever as my as my private guardian guardian angel or guardian divinity. And later on, of course, the narcissist ha- brings other people as human sacrifices to this moloch, moloch to this you know baal like um, mm. uh, divinity. And but but you're right to you're right to use the word choice. I, I think you may have, if I remember correctly, used the word choice. Mm. Indeed, there's a choice involved because the child. The child is faced with a variety of solutions. The child can, for example, become codependent. Uh, the mm. child can become uh, a narcissist. The child can become a psychopath, and so on and so on. Or a borderline, which is also a very common solution. Actually, more common than narcissism. So, children make this choice unawares. It's mostly an unconscious choice. But yes, they do make a choice. They choose either to be perpetual victims in a variety of ways, or to become the abuser themselves. So they kind of internalize the abuser. They, they, we call this process introduction. They internalize the abuser and merge with the abuser and become the abuser. It's uh, subsuming the abuser and becoming one, uh, becoming an abuser oneself. And is, that's narcissism. It, can the, um, is it always the parents that are the cause? Or can it be others? In the overwhelming majority of cases, it would be the parents because the formation of narcissism is very, very early on. It's, mm. It starts more or less at the age of four and, and possibly earlier. Um, so it would be in a majority of cases the parents. But of course, if the parents are absent to a very large degree, it could be other caregivers like grandparents. It could even be role models like a, a very decisive figure, like a teacher. It could even be, in in some cases, uh, a peer group, an abusive peer group. Right. Um, and we do have late onset narcissism, also called situational narcissism, where people are exposed to a very uh, stressful uh, um, lifestyle, or, um, for example, they become rock stars or famous politicians, or suddenly they become very rich. And this this external shock, this stressful external shock, renders them so narcissistic that they technically qualify for uh, for a diagnosis. Diagnosis. So, narcissism can be lo- late onset. Mm. However, the the bulk of of pathological narcissists, narcissism cases we see in practice, clinical practice, are people who were formed or malformed by their by their parents. And especially the mother. Hmm. I'm interested in the trend that seems to be happening more and more these days in that kids, they they just sit in front of the TV and watch TV all day or they watch uh, stuff on their on their iPad and they're getting a lot of their the messages about life and uh, how they need to view themselves. They're getting that from the advertisements and the TV channels. And uh, well, I, I'm I would, wondering if I that has some sort of role as well to play. I was wondering what you thought about that. Before I answer your question, I, I, I should think that you might find my interview with Richard Brannan. Richard Brannan. Of Richard Brannan, of interest. Um, I've just, I've 
just granted him an interview, a pretty lengthy one, as, as, mm. as is usually the case with me. <laughs> I just granted him a, a lengthy interview on the toxicity of social media. Ah. And if you go, and it, it went viral, by the way. So if you go to his channel, which is Spartan Life Coach channel, or Richard Grannon, I mean, and, and you uh, you can find this, um, the true, it's called the true, bombastically, it's called the true toxicity of social media or something like that. Mm. And I deal with, I, I relate to this question there. But again, in a nutshell, um, first of all, it's, it, it's recommended, it would behoove you to make a distinction between pathological narcissism, which is a clinical entity, and narcissistic behaviors and traits, which are um, universal. We all have healthy narcissism and we all display traits and behaviors which could be characterized as narcissistic from time to time. Oh, okay. And um, yes, narcissistic behaviors and traits could be condoned by society and rewarded uh, by by the culture and in cultures and societies and civilizations which are highly narcissistic in the sense that they elevate people with narcissistic traits and behaviors reward narcissistic uh, traits and behaviors etc etc we would find we would, we would tend to find a preponderance or an increase in narcissistic in narcissistic elements um, among youth and not only among the youth so but this is very little to do with pathological narcissism just uh, pathological narcissism is a, is a well-defined clinical entity mm. oh, okay i didn't know about that that difference so is that is that uh, a part of um why narcissists narcissism or narcissistic traits seem to be more prevalent in wealthy societies is what I've well, first of all, I would dispute. I would dispute this assertion. Oh, okay. They may be more visible, more visible in wealthy societies because wealthy societies um, have means of communication which are far more effective and far more pervasive, far more you know ubiquitous. Hmm. So it's very hard. It's very hard to observe narcissism in a remote, obscure village in in Kenya or in Sierra Leone than it is in, for example, Manhattan. Yeah. Um, and of course, the eyes, the eyes and ears of the global of the global media, are on Manhattan and London much more. They are on remote uh, Tora Bora mountains mm, in Afghanistan. Yes. Uh, but I, I would think that narcissism is a is a global phenomenon and does not discriminate between um, cultures and society. However, the way narcissism manifests um, would be different would be culturally conditioned or culture bound. In Japan, for example, which is a collectivist society, narcissism would be expressed collectively, would be express, expressed via belonging to a collective. Mm. So it is the collective that would be narcissistic on behalf of its members. Um, in the United States, where individualism uh, runs rampant and possibly could be described as malignant individualism, Narcissism would be an individualist, individual thing and would be expressed via the agency of individuals. But I think narcissism is, is um, absolutely as, you be, as the incidence and prevalence of narcissism, in my view, would be the same in Africa where I used to work for, where I've worked for four years. Mm. Would be the same in Africa as it would be in New York where I've lived for two years or in London where I've lived for, for another two years, etc. I've had exposure to well over 50 countries, and I was born in the Middle East. I've worked in Africa. I lived in the West. I've lived in Europe. I've lived in North North America, etc. And and I've had no reason, I no reason to conclude that narcissism is is less prevalent, for example, in Sierra Leone, where you know I've worked for one year, than in New York, where I've lived for two years. Only it manifests differently. Also, mm. society um, controls narcissistic behaviors and traits differently in different parts of the world. For example, it is condoned in, let us say, California, condoned, encouraged, egged on in California uh, and in New York, but it is frowned upon in societies such as Macedonia, where, where I am right now. Yeah. So it really... 
crucially depends on where you are. But narcissism is a force of nature. I think narcissism is on the rise simply because our numbers are on the rise. There are 7.6 billion people. When I was born, there were only three. It's far more difficult to stand out. It's far more difficult to feel unique and special. It's far more difficult to individuate, to feel uh, like an individual in a, in a, um, when you are immersed in an environment with 7.6 other billion people, billion other people. And that you're all so, connected to via social media and all of that. Right. When you're exposed to, to thousands of other people daily, if you want to be noticed, if you want to be just seen, if you want to be <laughs> acknowledged, as a separate individual with your own uniqueness, you have to stand out, you have to protest, you have to demonstrate, you have to be, become much more demonstrative. You have to, and so your behavior escalates and you become more and more vociferous, more and more um, unusual, more and more. So, and I think that's what we're seeing. I think we're seeing an arms race where people try to stand out and and everyone tries to outdo everyone else and one upmanship and and aggression are rewarded and extreme behavior uh, becomes the norm simply in order as i said to be noticed and seen the very basic function that was that used to be fulfilled in communities i mean only 100 years ago um, typically, you would have been born in a village yeah. and you would have been seen, acknowledged, noticed, gossiped, gossiped on, censored, praised, etc., etc., by an average of 2,000 people. The vast majority of people 100 or 150 years ago came across 2,000 other people. The overwhelming majority of people never traveled further than 20 miles yeah. and spent their entire lives in the same place they were born, carrying on the trades of their fathers and forefathers and would have interacted with six or seven clans, would have interbred, etc., etc. The environment was very limited. And so if you lived in a village or in a community or in a neighborhood, you were safe in the sense that you felt special. You felt unique. Because everyone knew everything about you. And everyone to, everyone took care of you and really cared about you. Even if, it, even if it were ironically in a malevolent way, still you would be noticed. You would be cared for. And today you live and you, you conduct an alienated existence among millions of other people. Um, your neighbors don't know who you are. You know, they don't care who you are. You can die in your own apartment. You would not be noticed until the stench, you know, drives everyone away. And your only, or, or you know, predominantly only uh, mode of interaction would be with so-called friends, impersonal, disembodied, digital uh, traces and avatars. It's an abnormal existence. And so just to feel alive you need to exaggerate this existence. You need to caricaturize your life. Mm. You need to become a symbol or an avatar as everyone else is. And you need to, you need to radicalize and you need to escalate your messages, your signaling, just to be noticed about the, about the din of everyone else doing the same. It's a terrifying think not to be noticed and not to be seen because we feel alive only when we're exposed to the gaze of others imagine if you walk the street and everyone looks through you as though you were transparent yeah. by the end of the day you will feel transparent you will feel that you don't exist you begin to doubt your own existence mm. and so we create holes of mirrors and these holes of mirrors called social media these holes of mirrors are, are there just to convince us that we are alive because we are no longer convinced that we are alive. And this leads to your question about the issue you've raised of consumerism. 
So I think the main role of consumerism is to convince us that we are alive mm. via possessions. But we'll come to it, I assume. Yeah, so I, I suppose, does advertising have a role to play with that? Because they're, they're trying to sell you almost like an identity that you can sort of latch onto. And, yeah, I, I, I don't know, is that something you've given some thought about? Well, advertising is a, a very a very compounded phenomenon. So advertising has very little to do with the content of the advertisement. Most people don't remember the content of the advertisement. They do remember, however, the advertiser. Yeah. So they would not they would not necessarily remember what it was that Apple had said about the iPhone X, but they will remember that it was Apple that put out the ad. So the ad carries a message which essentially says, I'm Apple, I'm financially robust, and the proof is that I have money to spend on advertising, and I care about my products, and I care about you, my customer, enough to expose you to my products. So it's a message of care. Indeed, it's a message of being seen. When you're exposed to an ad, the advertiser is, is telling you, in effect, I, I see you, I notice you, you matter to me, you're important to me. And I've gone to the length of investing millions of dollars in creating this special movie for you. It's a 30 second spot, admittedly, but it's still tailored to you. It's, so yes, it enhances, enhances the experience of uniqueness, of being seen and being noticed, being acknowledged. And also, it con- usually contains a series of subliminal, oh, subliminal, subliminal is wrong, mes- uh, wrong word, but series of hidden messages yeah. uh, about, about your status, relative positioning, ability to purchase the product, because the, the ads actually, ad actually tells you we trust that you have the money to buy our product. So we kind of believe in you and in your ability to earn. And so the, the ad has this conspiratorial tone. It's like, it's you and me, baby. I know that you are rich enough to buy me. I, know, I care enough about you. I see you. I believe that you deserve to own the iPhone. I mean, like, I believe in your status or ability to attain this status. And all you have to do is consume. So consumption is a message. Is, is I, I would agree with you that consumption is, um, or consumerism, is a narcissistic message in the sense that it singles out every individual. And there was a guy, there was a philosopher called Althusser. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Uh, what, what was the name, sorry? Althusser. Althusser. Louis, Louis, Louis Althusser. And Althusser called this process interpolation. Althusser said that advertisers exert a digital finger out of the screen, and this finger, like the finger of God in the Sistine Chapel, touches you and consecrates you and interpolates you. In other words, in other words, impels you to act. And he he, he has a whole theory of ad- advertising, which he put out in the sixties and seventies. Brilliant work, by the way. You can find my analysis of his work on my website. Cool, I'll, I'll and he deals, he deals directly with advertising and consumption. And so, does our consumer society have a, pl- uh, a part to play then, do you believe, in encouraging narcissism? Well, as I've just said, I think consumption and the attended me- attendant signaling, which is known as advertising and marketing, I think consumption is about narcissism. Mm. Um, first of all, we most of the products we consume are utterly unnecessary, obviously. So they must mm. fulfill some other kind of role. If they are, if they are not necessities, what are they? They must be signals or messages. In other words, most of the products we purchase are forms of communication, um, coded messages. And so some of them are what Veblen called, uh, Veblen called, uh, Thorsten Veblen called, uh, Conspicuous uh, consumption? Positional, positional goods. Goods that signify our, our position, our relative position in society. Mm. And others are about making you feel unique or making you feel special. And yet others are about making you feel that you belong. 
that you're part of some club and yet others make you feel that you're young again and yet others make you feel omnipotent because they contain so many functions and there's absolutely you can do everything with them and there's nothing you can't do with them yeah. and yet others make you feel omniscient uh, that's an important function of a smartphone for example uh, you are all knowing with a click of a button you have the entire the entire human knowledge at your at your fingertips and disposal and and so on and so forth so yes i would say that um most modern products have little to do with our necessity uh, they have a little to do with our needs and a lot to do with our self image and self perception they are about molding our self image and self perception to feel unique omniscient omnipotent uh, members of collectives which are omniscient and omnipotent co- uh, narcissistic not only individually but also collectively and so consumption from about 100 years ago has has been transformed from a system of catering to needs uh, into a system of catering Uh, sorry from a system of catering to physical needs into a system of catering to psychological needs mm. so while uh, let's say up until the 1890s up until the end of the industrial revolution most products and services were needs f- phys- physical needs oriented you bought a plow or you bought Uh, 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 I don't know, a dishwasher, you bought a, a laundry machine, or you bought a refrigerator, you, you bought something you needed, and, and your yeah. needs, or your needs were physical needs, up until, let's say, the 1950s, even. Everything you had bought catered to your physical needs. Physical needs as, a, as an animal who, who needs to eat and drink, physical needs as someone who needs to travel, physical needs, you know, but they were all physical needs. Yeah. Starting in the 1950s, Um, most products and services cater to cater to your psychological needs. Very few of them, indeed, vanishingly few of them, cater to your physical needs. Yeah. And your psychological needs can be grouped, can be amply described as narcissistic. The overwhelming majority of our psychological needs are uh, are in support of our narcissism. Now, as I said before, there's healthy narcissism. And there's pathological narcissism. And again, we can make a distinction. Between 1950s, between the 1950s and the 1980s, most of the products and services had to do or catered to our healthy narcissism. So, for example, they were geared to, to help us to learn and educate ourselves. Or they helped us to um, expand our horizons. Or they helped us to acquire skills which we could use in the workplace or they helped us to uh, as tourists to discover new territories and new cultures and new societies etc etc so i would say that in the history of modern consumption there are three stages from the beginning of the industrial revolution to the 1950s where most products and services catered to f- to physical needs from the 1950s to the 1980s where most products and services catered to our healthy psychological needs, including our healthy narcissism. And from the 1980s to this very day, where most products and services cater to our pathological narcissism, our need to be noticed and our need to be seen and to be observed and to be acknowledged as unique and special and in a pathological way, in a way that implies entitlement, in a way that implies delusion, in a way that implies self-deception, in a way that implies grandiosity, in a way that implies fantasy. All these are pathological adaptations and pathological uh, defense mechanisms. And the overwhelming vast majority of products and services nowadays cater exactly to these things. Fantasy, delusion, self-deception, grandiosity, lack of empathy, Um, separation, atomization, social seclusion, uh, etc., etc. Are there any... While, Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no. While you can't say
say this about products in the 1960s and 1970s, for example. They also catered to your narcissism. They also made you uh, special and unique and, and enhanced your skills and capabilities, but they did it in a very healthy way. What? Uh-huh. They were they were reality based. If you want me to give you a, a kind of litmus test, all products and services until the end of the 1980s were reality based. Yeah. They 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 acknowledge a reality test. Today's product and services take you away from reality, uh, away from social reality, away from physical reality, away from interactions, away from reality. Because you were you were talking when, about how uh, advertising and the products they make you feel something they make you feel like you have this but it's, it's devoid from reality i suppose yes i would say that until the, the late 1980s everything was reality based yeah the quality the quality of the product and the service and the commercial success of the product and service or service were based on reality how effective they are in helping us to manage reality, to manipulate reality, and to extract benefits from reality. Products and services that came after the dot-com boom and bust, these products and services are not reality-based. They are yeah. actually ways and means to avoid reality, to shun reality, to escape from reality, and to construct alternative realities, virtual realities, augmented realities avoid social reality, avoid true interaction, Mm. avoid um, coping with real life challenges, avoid acquiring real life skills, etc, etc. We are escaping from reality and society and all other social institutions are disintegrating. We have a process called atomization, where everyone um, sits at home, isolated with a series of screens of varying sizes and interacts essentially with other people who are doing exactly the same. (laughs) And and the sizes of the size of screens can tell you the whole story. If you go back to the nineteen fifties, the dominant screen was huge. Yeah. And about two thousand people could could congregate in front of that screen and share a common experience. And that screen was the cinema (laughs) in the nineteen fifties. And then Fast forward 20 years, and you had a much smaller screen, or 30 years actually, or 20 years, you had a much smaller screen, and only 20, 30 people could congregate in front of that screen and have a common experience. And that screen was a television. And then fast forward another 20 years, and you have an even much smaller screen, and only two, three people could share the experience of that screen, and that was the personal computer. And then the screens kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, until today's screen allows only one person to interact with it. It's a one-person interaction, and that would be the smartphone or your watch, your smartwatch. So screens tell the whole story. Screens are a metaphor to what's happening to us. At the very beginning of screens, in the 1950s or, or even 1930s, we wanted to have communal experiences shared with thousands of other people. Today, we don't want other people. I mean, think of the way that you hold your smartphone. Yeah. You hold the smartphone in front of your face. The mm. smartphone isolates you from your environment. It's kind of a firewall. Yeah. The smartphone was designed to separate you from reality, to separate you from other people. There could have been any number of design choices in designing the typical smartphone. But from the very beginning, smartphones were built designed and constructed to separate you from life, to provide you with an alternative to life. And so modern consumption and modern consumer goods are about isolating you and rendering you a hostage, in effect, a prisoner. They are uh, total ecosystems. All previous consumer goods up to the 1980s were not total ecosystems in the sense that you could not interact only with a single product and need nothing else. You could not, for example, interact with your refrigerator only or with your laundry machine only or even with your personal computer only or with your television only. You had had to go 
out to reality. You had to talk to other people. You had to use other devices. You had to have a network, both social and electronic, in order to survive. But today's devices, today's consumer goods, are self-contained, self-sustaining, self-sufficient, and they isolate you because they provide you with a total solution. And mm -hmm. I, they could safely be called total consumer goods or total devices, and they provide a total ecosystem. By the way, you see it in the way that these devices are designed. Because, for example, Apple. Yeah. You can't use an Apple, you cannot use an Apple device if you go outside the Apple ecosystem. You must remain hostage and prisoner to Apple's offerings. Apple's App Store, everything is Apple. Yeah. Everything is branded Apple. Look at Facebook, for example. Facebook does not allow Google to to uh, crawl. Does not allow Google to crawl its data databases. There are no Facebook results on Google. Google, because Google ke keeps its content behind a paywall, a firewall, and a paywall, so that Google has no access to it. What happens is modern consumer modern modern consumerism, modern consumer devices fractured our world, broke it apart. So that if you if you interact on Facebook, you are the hostage of Facebook. You are Facebook's prisoner. If you interact with Apple, you're Apple's prisoner. They don't want you to go outside the the walls of the ecosystem. Which is exact opposite philosophy to the philosophy of the network which prevailed in the eighties and beginning of the nineties. The exact opposite philosophy. Mm. And you can see the same happening with um, with countries. Countries like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia. They isolate their consumers behind their firewalls. They don't allow their consumers free access to, for example, information. Or even to consumer goods. So um, we are seeing a fracturing and atomization of, of life, of social life, of society as a whole, of institutions, and this has direct linkage to modern technologies and the consumer goods that they produce. So consumerism is not only about narcissism in the individual level, it's about the emerging very disturbing trend of collective narcissism, exactly the trend that brings to power people like Donald Trump yeah. or Bolsonaro in Brazil or Duterte in the Philippines. We are beginning to see a confluence of consumerism with politics, technology with politics. Donald Trump is a technological president, exactly like Adolf Hitler. Adolf mm. Hitler used consumer goods and technologies which were the cutting edge technologies in his period. He used movie theaters, he used the microphone, he used the airplane, he used the radio, and he was the first to use television. Mm. So Adolf Hitler was a highly technological leader in a narcissistic psychopathic age, using consumer goods in a way that fractured and broke society apart. And people like Donald Trump are doing the same. So consumer goods dictate not only how we as individuals interact with the world, but how collectives interact with the world via institutions such as politics. It's an extremely, extremely dangerous and worrying trend. Where do you see that trend sort of heading to in the next sort of 20 years? Well, first of all, I think that uh, and again, I encourage you to have a look at the interview I made with uh, Richard Brennan, uh, because it's very, very detailed and so on. Just allow me a sip of water. Apologies. So, as far as as far as the future, for, first of all, I think for the first time, for the first time ever, so when we talk about Adolf Hitler, we are talking about a phenomenon which was largely European, started in Germany and infected the rest of Europe. But that's where it ended, more or less. But the first time, I think, we are talking about a global, a global a, a pandemic, a, a global phenomenon, a truly global phenomenon. And um, we are talking about, and that's 
why I'm comparing social media and modern consumer goods to viruses, essentially. Mm. Because exactly like in epidemi epidemiology, we have vectors of transmission and we have spreading um, memes and so on, which imitate very effectively the behavior of viruses. So as I see, I think what exactly like viruses are self-limiting, I think the technology and the consumer goods, current consumer goods, are self-limiting. There will come a point where people will simply draw back in horror and recoil. But it will be too late for, for many of us because social media, consumer, uh, modern consumer goods, they are constructed to be addictive. They are constructed to condition us. As I said, they render, render us hostages and prisoners, not only physically, but also psychologically. So there's a lot of addiction and conditioning going on. A lot mm. of the planned obsolescence, which is a typical feature of most consumer goods, a lot of the planned obsolescence has to do with the attempt to condition us to buy new versions, new updates, new um, generations of the same devices and the same goods and the same services. So there will, there will remain a group of people addicted to all these paraphernalia, to, to social media, to consumer goods, etc. And there will be a rebellion against a counter-revolution a counter trend where people will try to free themselves of the shackles of modern consumerism. And we're beginning to see, of course, the buds of this revolution. But I think what, what it will do is it will fracture humanity to two camps. The camp of people who find consumption gratifying because it caters to their narcissistic needs. And these people will continue to be addicted and conditioned by innovation, by technology, by mod by uh, uh, new consumer goods, etc., etc., and one billion, two billion people will be like that. They will continue their existence as it is now, uh, forever consuming, forever working hard in order to consume, forever forever using consumer goods as status symbols, as positional goods, forever bragging, forever showing off, forever you know delineating or demarcating the uniqueness. Uh, via consumer goods, via social media and so on. And there will be a, a, the rest of humanity which will break, break free. I believe in that. Mm. Because all viruses are self-limiting in the sense that at some point they stop propagating. Had viruses not stopped propagating, we would all be dead by now. Yeah. So I believe that consumer goods are the kinds, kinds of viruses which, and, and I believe the trend is about to stop. And then humanity will fracture. And we will have these two camps. That's how I see things. The other camp, the rebellious camp, I think will consume a lot less. We'll consume differently. More, should we say, in a balanced way. We'll consume not narcissistically, in a healthy way. And I think this will have tremendous destabilizing repercussions. Because the entire mass production system, our entire modern economy, all modern economies, West and East, are built and founded on the assumption of ever increasing consumption. If we take, if we pull the rug under the feet of multinationals, manufacturers, uh, service providers, we are going to collapse the modern economy. And I think the rug is about to be pulled. Really? I think this revolutionary movement that I'm talking about, people who are gonna people are gonna renounce social media. People are going who are going to consume less. People who are going to move to the countryside. People who are going to consume wisely. People who are going to eschew to give up uh, goods and services which are not necessities. People who are going to revert to retro lifestyles. I think this movement is on the rise, and I think it's going to be actually become actually dominant. Counter a counterculture, a subculture or counterculture of non-consume consumerism. I believe it's. I believe the revolution is happening. But here's the irony: we can't afford not to not consume. 
should we stop consuming even marginally the entire edifice of modern economies will crumble and then of course we will have provoked enormous social unrest everywhere and possibly global wars mm -hmm. so this is the dilemma on the one hand our consumption to patterns today are sick addictive conditioned narcissistic atomizing destructive the way we consume is destroying us destroying us as individuals destroying us as societies destroying us as collectives destroying and ruining and devastating our institutions starting with the family and ending with the state raising to power demagogues narcissistic and psychopathic leaders at great risk to peace in our future our consumption leads us into a blind alley of self annihilation but we can't afford to stop consuming because if we stop consuming we will have uh, we will have removed the the foundations of modern economics modern economies i'm sorry and then the global economy will collapse and then we will have such social unrest which will most probably lead to global warfare and again to our self destruction it's a no win situation if we continue to consume we will annihilate self annihilate if we stop consuming we will self annihilate and this is the double bind that we we'll find ourselves in this is the blind alley that we led ourselves into the cul de sac and i'm not, i'm not wise enough to offer a solution i don't think anyone is <laughs> sobering thoughts um yeah. uh you so um where where i sort of heard of you first was through your book after the rain and right. you you drew a, a fascinating parallel i thought between uh, our, our consumer culture and uh, religion and so you made the point that shopping malls and banks have almost replaced the temples and bankers, finances and bureaucrats, the clergy um, and so I, I wonder if that's going to be increasingly the case then with this yeah, yeah go ahead no, uh, sorry, go ahead yes, of course we have uh, as i said consumerism is a i i i started by saying that narcissism is a form of private religion yeah and so consumerism is a, is a, a private case of narcissism writ large let's say so of course by by definition ipso facto i mean uh, by syllogism consumerism is a form of religion and we worship at the temples of consumption first of all consumerism as a form of secular religion as its own its own um, holy bible its own holy scriptures and it has its rituals and it has its ethos and morality and it has its do's and don'ts prescriptive and proscriptive measures and it has its clergy and it has its servants and it has its bureaucracy etc etc it's absolutely a form of secular religion mm. of course it has its headquarters the equivalent of the vatican and that would be the United States, and um, and so on. So yes, I think we have replaced um, classic God-centered religion. And and by the way, I'm an agnostic, so don't misunderstand me. I'm not advocating God-centered religion and other forms of mass psychosis. But we have replaced God-centered religion, one form of mass psychosis, with another, and that is the, the belief that the fount of happiness. Because religion is about finding happiness, finding balance, being at harmony and equilibrium with your environment, social and natural. That's what religion is about, essentially. God is supposed to be the 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 guide, provide the guidance on how to achieve this balance. And so here comes consumerism and tells you, listen, there's another way to happiness, another path to happiness, and that is by buying things goods and services even if they are not necessary they will cause you happiness and a huge amount of people bought into it and they are rendered happy they believe simply by purchasing the next generation of iphone 
or simply by buying a massage, a massage parlor, or whatever. So, uh, consumerism provides a complete turnkey solution and substitute to religion. And that's why it's far more widespread than any religion or, or, the, or any group of religions combined. And I stand behind it, yes. Mm. Shopping malls are the modern temples. And what, what price do you think we, as um, consumers or as, uh, as people, what price do we psychologically pay for that? How does it affect us psychologically? Well, if your only source of happiness is consumption, then first of all, the prerequisite, the precondition for consumption is money. So money becomes not only desirable, but indispensable. Money becomes the condition, the absolute condition, foundation, and so on for your happiness. And so we all become money crazed. And the problem with money, of course, is that it's morally neutral. It's not immoral. It's not. It's amoral. Mm. It has no track with morality or ethics in any way, shape, or form. We're trying to impose moral values on money making. But these are foreign implants. Money in itself is morally neutral. And, and so when we adhere to this new religion where money is God and the guiding principle and our organizing principle of reality and the fount of our happiness, we also ascribe automatically, um, subscribe to a world which is amoral and mo- or morally relative or morally neutral. And if we subscribe to that, then essentially the only remaining principle guiding our behavior is selfishness or more precisely egotism. And then if if we accept selfishness and egotism as the only remaining or surviving moral principle, then by definition, empathy and altruism, for example, are irrational not only irrational, but counterproductive, because they become obstacle and in, obstacles and hindrances to the making of money. Mm-hmm. In other words, we tend to maximize utility. In a, we want as much money as we can, because the more money we have, the more happiness we have, via the agency of consumer goods and consumer services. So, in order to maximize the production of money, or the ownership or possession of money, we need to be disempathic. We need to eschew. We need to give up empathy. And of course, we need not to be altruistic because that's a waste of resources. And so we see a, a rising tide, a tidal wave of uh, unempathic behavior, self centered behavior, um, and utilitarian behavior. And when you try to broach the subject of whether this is good or bad, People tell you openly that good or bad bad are obsolete categories of relating to the world. They are no longer relevant. Mm. This good or bad cannot be applied to money making. There's no good money making or bad money making. There's only money making. And so good and bad, good and evil are on their way out. And so we we live in a world that is becoming increasingly life threatening, uh, increasingly unpredictable increasingly capricious and arbitrary and hostile and dangerous to live in and also frankly unpleasant to live in the world today i don't know how old you are strike me as too young it's too young to remember but sorry uh 22 (laughs) you see the world today is a lot less pleasant than it used to be now of course every old geezer will tell you the same (laughs) The world today is a lot less pleasant, etc., etc. And people who are born into this world take it for granted. They have no basis for comparison. So say, so okay, you know, old people talk like that. But it's truly less pleasant. You have to trust me on this. <laughs> it's simply bad. It's more bad. It's worse than it used to be. Not in the sense that. Uh, you know, it's more restricted. Actually, it's, it's much more free. It's much more tolerant. It's much more empowering. The technology is empowering. So I'm not 
blind to the advantages of the world today, that the world is offering today, as compared to the world of my childhood or my 20s. But it was a hell of a lot more pleasant, simply. More agreeable, let's say. Today's world is more jungle-like, more natural selection type. And everything is fleeting. Nothing is really deep. Everything is fleeting. It's not that people don't seek depth. They do. They do seek depth and love and commitment. But it's nowhere to be found. Because if the guiding principle is money, because money buys you things, and things make me ha- make you happy, then it's a race, isn't it? Mm. It's become it becomes an addiction. The world became a giant drug dispensing center. Everyone is a pusher or a drug addict. The world is divided to pushers and junkies. We all became junkies, and with a junkie mentality. You know, instant gratification. Junkies want instant gratification. Uh, no holds barred. To get to get his money, the junkie will steal from his own mother because he needs the fix. We are all fix oriented, and it's getting the fix is getting shorter and shorter because we 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 become desensitized. So now it's not enough to buy an iPhone. Mm. You need also an iPad, and then it's not enough to buy an iPad. You need also to fuck around. I mean, <laughs> the, the the fixes become much the pace, the pace of change, and the pace of your need for the next fix. It's, it's becoming it's accelerated. There's an acceleration going on, and so in a world like that, it's a rat race. It's it's insane. It's a nightmarish of it. It's realistic. I was reading an interesting uh, analogy to consumerism uh, where this author was saying that consumerism is almost like seawater uh, where you're you're thirsty and you need something and you see the seawater and so you drink it and you think it's going to satisfy you but it never does and unfortunately within our society we think oh well to, to be satisfied I need to just have more of it and it's having the opposite effect I think also the analogy of, of a drug drug culture applies. Mm. It's a drug. It's addictive. It's and you know and it and as you know, in, when you consume drugs, you need more and more all the time. Mm. The threshold goes up all the time. So at first you needed one fix a day, then you need two, then six, then nine. Then there's an overdose and you die. Mm. And I think that's where he- where we're heading. Basically, you ask me where are we heading? We're heading to an <laughs> overdose. Um, well, <laughs> uh, I've, I've reached the end of my questions. Um, That's good, thank- because I reached the end of my answers. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, can I ask you for a favour? Oh, yeah, sure. Is, is there any, any way you can upload the audio file somewhere, so that I can download it? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, sure. Yeah? Send me a link, if you if you please. That'll be my only reward, uh, <laughs> except talking to you, of course. Send me send me a link so that I can download the audio file, and then would you mind if I upload the audio file somewhere, make uh, it public? Yeah, okay. It's okay with you. Are you sure? Yeah, if you yeah, just yeah, that's fine. It's fine with you. Yeah, okay. I'd rather if it didn't say like my name, but that's absolutely, I'll keep fine. you anonymous if, if you prefer. Sure. Thank you. Well, actually, no, I don't mind. Yeah, uh, uh, feel free. Well, you know, what? send me the link, and uh, in the same email write to me how you wish to be identified and if you wish to be identified so and then I'll, I'll abide by anything you say of course brilliant okay but please don't forget it's important to me if you yeah. if you if you don't mind I'll get it sent pretty soon okay thank you very much was that are there any other things that you wanted to say that I didn't ask or? no I think we've been we've been pretty thorough I, I thought I mean I think we covered Absolutely. a lot of a lot of ground yeah this has been really helpful I hope so Thank you so it's much. Been a pleasure for, in any yeah, case. thank you so much for giving up your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Ah, we've gone bang on one hour. There we go. <laughs> okay, great. That's a good a good time for an audio recording. Yeah. So don't forget the link, please. Yeah. And if you need anything further, you can write to me, and then you know we can even schedule a follow up if you came up with new questions and so on. Don't hesitate. Just write to me, and we'll, we'll do something again. Thank you, Sam. You're most welcome.
and success with your with your thesis. Thank you so much. I hope you have a, a great Sunday. You too. Take care. Bye bye.